conversations about things that are challenging subjects to talk about. Uh, and so I appreciate you kind of walking down this path with myself and um, uh, council members, uh, QB and Keating, and obviously members of our city staff. Uh, and I just, so, I mean, I know that tonight may be, it's going to be an interesting conversation. It may be uncomfortable in places, but as we've talked about, uh, it's only through the uncomfortable nature of some of these discussions that we're having that we truly can get to a better place together. So I just appreciate you all hanging in there with all of us and being willing to be part of this task force. It's very important work. And I honestly can't think of, uh, you know, 20 plus better people to be involved with it. So thank you so much. Just appreciate it and looking forward to this evening. Great. Thank you, Mayor. We're going to move to the next slide, and that is to your right. It's 1.05, and this is the time we have reserved for public comments. So I'm going to turn this over to Mayoral A. Brianne Fisher. Hello, everyone. We have one public comment today. It is from Brie Alenius. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing her last name right. She is um, a resident of Tempe, Arizona. Her comment says, Dear Public Safety and Advisory Task Force, a discrepancy in fair and impartial policing has come to my attention, and I would like to ask for your consideration in this matter. Over the course of the last six months, our country has endured many obstacles. As we gather together in order to execute our rights in America, specifically within our local communities, many of us have partaken in rallies and peaceful protests, as it is our right to do so. As a resident of the city of Tempe, I have seen and heard of many rallies and protests taking place within my city, some even in my neighborhood. Despite typical COVID guidelines, city officials have allowed many of these events to take place without the enforcement of guidelines such as masks, social distancing, and group sizes. People have gathered without, with and without masks in the hundreds without social distancing for months, many of which have also used amplified sound in order to project their voices to the crowds without acquiring special events or use permit for the use of amplified sound. These groups have done so without being cited. That being said, I support these rights. However, I also support fairness across the board. On Sunday, November 1st, a faith-based group called Let Us Worship gathered at Tempe Beach Park in order to worship and pray in support of religious freedom. Throughout the day, police officers and event coordinators were in contact with faith-based group and the discussion was never had as to acquiring permits or warnings being used, issued. Tempe government officials are now considering charging the group with the following violations violation of the City of Tempe June 18, 2020 Mayoral Proclamation that mandates the wearing of face coverings under specific circumstances, violation of the Governor's Executive Order 2020-52 and 2020-43, violation of Section 5-2 of Tempe City Code for not obtaining a City Special Events Permit, violation of Section 23-37 and Section 23-46 Tempe City Code for driving a vehicle in a city park and for using sound applications equipment without a permit respectively. I am writing this because I believe in fair application of the law. We can't have a double standard within our local government. I have sat in my backyard while protesters have walked down the streets yelling, gathering in large numbers without masks and using amplified sound and microphones. My issue is not with protests or rallies. My issue is with how they are enforced. It is a double standard to see our local government tolerating these things sometimes and not others. I won't get into the politics of it all, but we do need to hold our local government accountable. In order to represent us, they need to hear from us. This sort of persecution towards a targeted people group is a disgrace to the integrity of our local government. With all due respect, Mayor Corey Woods, this is the new direction you want to take the city of Tempe. Thank you. And that is all. Thank you, Brianne. Um, so with that, we will uh, move to our next slide, which is 2.01. And I'd like to turn this over to Rosie and Chelsea. Thank you, Wydell. Welcome. I don't think I see the slide yet. Are you looking on Miro, Rosa? I'm sorry. Yep. Um, I'm on it. If you follow my face, 
I just refreshed a little bit. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Well, welcome everyone. Rosen Chasti, for those who may not know me, Director of Strategic Management and Diversity. And our office has had the honor of facilitating this very meaningful conversation for our city. So before getting started with a few slides, just to explain what the process is today, I wanted just to affirm some of the comments we heard about the last session and acknowledge that as the mayor said, which actually the mayor and I did not speak about what slides or what we were both uh, speaking about during our intro, but it mirrors one another. He speaks about being uncomfortable. Um, how do we handle the uncomfortable space? And at the end of the last session, I think it felt uncomfortable for some folks. And I wanted to assure all of you that that is really where the change happens. Um, as we all think about our own personal lives, perhaps some of the changes that we have made have come about through some challenging situations. You think about divorce, or you think about death in our own families, or you think about um, loss of loved ones on any level. Um, and that is when our lives then pivot and change in different directions. Organizations and these type of conversations are no different. And I always say, don't take my word for it, but kind of take the word of people who are much smarter than myself and our office and people who come before us who kind of outline that, um, that framework. Next slide. So Tuckman's model on group stages, you probably never heard of Tuckman's or maybe you have, um, but there is uh, individuals who identified this long, long time ago, 1977, and identified that there are four, five specific areas that a group kind of goes through. Um, the initial is forming, which is very little agreement, um, trying to identify what the purpose of the group is, trying to seek guidance and direction, and then we get into the storming, and that might feel familiar or sound familiar. Think about the storming and how it's identified conflict, increased clarity of purpose, power struggles, and perhaps some need of coaching as far as the direction. Third session, we are in the norming, agreement and consensus, uh, clear rules on responsibilities, which we'll talk about, facilitation, which we'll talk a little bit more. And then we get into performing, which is hopefully where we will be very soon. Clear vision and purpose, focus on achievements and delineating kind of responsibilities. And then finally, adjourning. Um, task completion, goal feeling about, uh, good feeling about feeling accomplished and the recognition of all of you um, for helping our city navigate these times. Next slide. So in the next two hours and 45 minutes, yeah. I wanted to share with you the process for today, what you can anticipate. Um, so overall, uh, the case and information that we have shared with you regarding Antonia Arce, um, Jonay Harrison from the Strategic Management and Diversity Office, our Equity and Inclusion Manager, will give an overview of the case um, for 30 minutes. We will then pause um, for a few minutes uh, with the direction of giving you, uh, asking you as individuals to think about some questions that you will bring back some ideas into the breakout rooms. Uh, we will give you about 10 minutes to do that. There will be three breakout rooms, much unlike other sessions that we've had where we've had five, we're only gonna do three. Um, in the interest of time, they're going to be pre-assigned um, and you will be able to know exactly what room will be teleported by Wydell as she does so smoothly. Um, and they will be facilitated by myself, Jonay, and Wydell. You already have scribes assigned, so you don't have to worry about who's going to take notes. And you will <laughs> only concentrate, I heard that giggle because I think that was very stressful for people. Um, so we will have scribes. We will we're asking you, your job is to really concentrate on your ideas, your life experiences, your perspective, your affiliations, and give us the best ideas you have on solutions to the conversations and the questions that we'll be posing to you. You will come back into the larger group where we would discuss the ideas from the three groups. And then we will assemble what we call the initial framework of a strategic plan. 
This will be facilitated by Wydell, and this will identify themes, buckets, or groupings, as we call them, that will organically take place um, through the conversation. And Wydell's very much experienced with that, so I have full confidence that we will get there. The most important part for me of that session is we actually get to see action in, 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 um, in that session. We will get to see some deliverables. So today's results, at the end of the three hours, we will have a framework. Next slide. I always say when you're reading a good book, sometimes the best part is reading the ending real quick to kind of give you an idea of what's coming. And I can share with you what the strategic plan will look like. And this is just an example. And just for illustrative purposes, please do not think that this is what it's going to. This is just fill in that we have created in some in Latin form um, in Latin language, just to make sure that you kind of see visually what it's going to look like. We will have themes on the on the uh, as buckets and then all the information from your groups, your ideas to advance those specific buckets and themes. So, for example, you may have mental health care seven and then we will look at perhaps some of the recommendations that you have made regarding mental health in those categories. Next slide. So to do this, it's not just the function of creating questions or critical questions for you to answer. You have to set the table, as I always say, that creates the environment in order for that to take place. And that's just as important as the conversations. So in speaking with Chief Glover, and we have many conversations, I've obviously for planning for these type of conversations, um, we, we identified a specific and critical point, which is creating neutral space for all of you in those breakout rooms for conversations. So as human beings, often we look to others who are subject matter experts when we ask questions, and sometimes it could be just as innocent in asking a questions, but we defer to those individuals because informally or formally, we believe that they have better answers. Um, we have decided that uh, the best interest is not to have police represented in the breakout rooms to create a truly neutral place for all of you to come up with ideas. What Jonay will be sharing with you in that case study is very important information. And that is also a neutral point I want to share with you. The police department will not be sharing the, the, the information regarding the RSA case it was decided that Jonay would do that and also to create that neutral space in the delivery of the information. Chief Glover, do you have anything else to add to that? Yeah, I'll uh, add uh, real quick that, you know, today's uh, session in the breakout groups, um, we are gonna have those subject matter experts not in the group because we want your unfiltered response. We want the raw response um, to come out uh, as, to your reactions to you know what the case involves and where we need to go from here. Uh, so in order to do that, we don't want to. We didn't want the uh, subject matter experts to sort of guide opinion. Um, we want it to come unfiltered from you, and and that's part of that that decision uh, in moving forward without subject matter experts within the breakout groups, which I which I think will provide a much more honest assessment. Thanks, Chief. I appreciate that. So the other to do list, obviously, aside from creating the neutral space is also shared agreement. And I think this is a great point for us to kind of make sure that we're all on the same page as we move into a very serious conversation regarding um, a tough subject matter. Next slide. So in reviewing all the notes and the chats of the previous sessions, we found one quote that kind of stood out and I'm not sure who wrote it, a task force member, it was on 1028 and they wrote shared agreement. It was one of the suggestions we want to share, ensure that we feel safe to express our ideas. People need to be free to share the ideas, even those that might not be popular so that we can speak about them in a way that makes sense for, for us to move forward or going forward. So we thought about that and we just created some initial thoughts for you to consider as far as agreements. 
One is speak from the place of comfort while encouraging others to do the same and looking around to make sure that the colleagues also are encouraged to speak. Engage with the intent of understanding and that does not mean that there has to be agreement. Respect the group and the mindfulness of, of what is occurring. So really in essence is looking for respect from everyone in that airtime. And that might look like sharing airtime or approachability in the conversation. Giving grace. I think this is a very important for all of us. Giving grace and expect the best from your colleagues. Um, and then lastly, staying focused on what on the work at hand, which I think is really uh, important and imperative today. We are here to make sure that we are putting forth the best creative ideas and solutions that helps to really heal our organization and our city and what's happened. So I turn to all of you right now as my colleagues and ask what's missing and perhaps we can take a few minutes just to identify if anything is missing from the list. Rydell, do you see anything in the chat? So I'm looking right now. Um, what's missing? We have conversations that center equity. A reminder that my level of comfort for the person who wrote this um, may be different from your level of comfort. And what's missing is accountability, not just respect. And we're also getting, I may be comfortable, I may be very comfortable with discomfort. And another insight was to confront ideas, not people. And ask open ended inquisitive questions. Leaning into discomfort is more important than being consistently comfortable. And willingness to learn. and truth and transparency from all city officials. Discomfort and space to explore that creates a learning space. I'm checking the chat to see if we have any more. <clears throat> Great. And respect the time for each spe speaker, parentheses, no pontificating. And we'll move these over to the shared agreement so that we have it for our future meetings as well. Thank you, Wydell. Thank you. Oh, and uh, centering of those most impacted. Perfect. Thank you all for giving us your feedback. We want to make sure uh, one, our, <laughs> and then one more thing is pontification is subjective. Okay. Okay. And one final one, Rosa, is accountability without providing technical terms that take away from actual events that occurred. I think that's an excellent segue. Perfect. The next person who will be pre presenting is Janae Harrison, as I shared with you. She will be giving um, Pi for the next 20 to 30 minutes, an overview of the RSAFE case. I wanted to take a moment here and let you know that it was imperative for us, the mayor, the council, and those of us on the phone uh, on this call um, to make sure that the RSA family was consulted and we did receive permission for them from, from the family to um, use this as a case study for us to great gain greater understanding of perhaps our failures and more importantly of ideas to make sure that this never happens again. And while this isn't scripted um, and obviously you have slides, I'd like to take a moment before Janae, I turn this over to Janae. And um, as staff, this is a very difficult subject. 
Um, and as I mentioned, we have a lot of meetings with um, interim chief Glover and the command staff and uh, discussing how we would deliver this message. And, and I hope chief Glover doesn't mind, but I'd like to share for a moment yesterday what took place. Uh, so we had a meeting regarding how would Janae would deliver this information. It was just a crash course for Janae reading all the materials and making sure she distilled the information in, in a very meaningful way for all of you to understand in case you weren't able to read the information that we provided. And at one moment she paused and said, is there anything that I need to remember to make sure that I convey from all of you? regarding this case. And um, resoundingly, it was, this should have never happened. Um, and it was, you could hear a pin drop that this happened in our community and we need to make sure it never happens again. And there was just a moment for all of us that was very difficult. And Chief Glover, if I'm forgetting anything, is there anything else that you would like to add before we turn it over to Janae? Well, I mean, this whole circumstance, uh, the Antonio Arce uh, case, is, it's, uh, it's really a, a difficult one for us because as we had explained in that meeting yesterday is that this should have never had happened. Um, this is a tragic um, situation and there's no, there is no way that we could ever justify or provide an excuse for what had occurred in that situation. And so that was one of the things that we really um, wanted to make sure that we had expressed, um, you know, and this information that, you know, that you were providing um, in the case study, I mean, it's, it's, it's still very raw and still very sensitive for a lot of us, um, and it, as it will be for, for all of you um, as well. And, um, but the failures that have uh, sort of been highlighted um, through the examples of, of what happened or what, what uh, took place um, is going to be laid out uh, for you through uh, Ms. Harrison's um, explanation um, as she goes through the case study with you. Uh, so we're, you know, we want to listen. Uh, we're wanting to know from our community um, based on this case and, and some of the takeaways that, that you see on how we're able to improve our organization moving forward. And so I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, Chief. I don't think there's anything else to be said at the moment besides turning this over to Janae. Thank you. Thank you, Just Chief. Just as a technical note, we are on the 12th frame. And so please join us there. If you have any challenges, please go into the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. And <clears throat> thank you, Rosa. Again, my name is Joni Harrison and I am the equity and inclusion manager for the city. Um, I want to start by being myself very transparent, even in the gravity of this moment with you, um, that I'm humbled and to be very honest, I'm a bit anxious to present the case. I appreciate that now since January of 2019 that there is anger and there's sadness but there's also courage that comes along with you all stepping into this space with us to review the case together. And when we are committing to do good through the entirety of this process, I truly believe that we are honoring the family of Antonio Arce and we are honoring his memory by this, by this work. Um, we're all humans and we're fallible here and how I process and how I convey. And, and, and I ask that in thinking about the humanity of each of us, even sitting here today as we're going through this case, I'm challenging you task force members and also community members to put yourself in the shoes of these individuals to see where we can stretch and grow as a, as a community. So I'm asking you to look at the humanity of the neighbors that are around this house, looking at the anonymous callers that made the call uh, that initiated this. I'm asking you to think about the witnesses, the store owner. I'm asking you to think about the officer in training 
who was still on the field and, and saw Antonio, I'm asking you to think about the EMS team that had to work on this 14 year old boy. And I'm asking you to stretch and to grow with me. That we use these perspectives as a catalyst for how we come up with the ideas and answers to the question that you're going to see on this next screen. Um, and we can move to that next screen. These questions, when we're presenting the case, what does this case bring up? What reactions create ideas? What possibilities can we explore? What can we learn from this case? The answers to those questions really are going to shape how we as a city protect our residents. This is about community, it's about policing, it's about trust and accountability, it's about transparency. This is the reason this task force was convened. But knowing that no singular part is greater than the whole when it comes to improving how we ensure our safety. So we're digging in, be patient with me, be patient with yourselves. I want to say that we're going to walk through the facts only. I'm doing this as a summation. I want you to know I'm walking through the facts for the task force members that maybe didn't have a chance to read through a thousand and some pages or that got caught up or the emotion of the case or I'm not doing analysis. I'm not relitigating or re-adjudicating this this case, but what we're doing collectively, what the Strategic Management and Diversity Office, what the PD department did was put faith in me to present this to you in a factual way, as factual as possible. And so with that said, the order of the presentation is as chronological as possible, but I've put them in groupings of information from the various sources that you all have at your fingertips whenever you have time to de delve deeply into this between now and the next time we gather. And so look at those questions, but most importantly, just as I hear in my full humanity am nervous and shaking, if you need to talk about this, if you need to process this, we're going to put CARE 7 in the chat, uh, the number of one of our CARE 7 representatives at any time. If this brings up a motion for you that you need to process as well, um, please feel free to utilize that service. So here we go. I'm going to start with the executive summary that was conducted by Sergeant Johnson, who is our professional standards unit investigator. Um, the criminal investigation is separate from the in administrative investigation. All right. The criminal investigation concluded on February 20th, 2019 and was forwarded to the Maricopa County Attorney's Office for charging. And as we all know at this point, the charging decision stated, and I quote, it is the opinion of the county attorney that the evidence presented in this investigation does not support criminal prosecution and therefore there is no reasonable likelihood of conviction. In this review, we're not looking at the criminal investigation. We are looking into the administrative investigation. Okay. March 2019, the administrative investigation was launched into this matter. And as I said, there were multiple officers that were part of this. Uh, there were responding officers such as Officer Cano, Officer in Training Cantos, Lewis, Warbington, Welling, Welling, Coger, Detective Ramos. We're going to talk a little bit about what they shared. But I want you all to know that Officer Hine um, was placed on FMLA at the direction of his physician. So no administrative interview was conducted by Officer Hine. It was scheduled for Friday, March the 29th, 
but on March the 28th, the administrative investigator learned that Officer Hine was on FMLA um, and was not going to be a part of the administrative review. So let's do a little bit about the background of Officer Hine. Officer Hine started his employment with Tempe Police Department in January 2005. And before his employment with Tempe PD, he was employed as a police officer with Bullhead City Police Department from January 2002 until January 2005. While there, he became a part of the PD SWAT team at Bullhead City. And he has attended 80 hour in house SWAT school. He participated in five call outs. That means he was a part of an entry team that required special knowledge and awareness as to police equipment. And he served as a primary entry operator. That means he was a part of the primary teams that would enter into high profile cases. Officer Hines certification as a police officer remained in good standing during the duration of his 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 um, certification. And we know that he met at least the basic yearly minimums in training and proficiency requirements. He um, did officer advanced training or advanced officer training, which is held a minimum of two times a year where attendance is mandatory. If you'd like a summation of the other trainings that he had, I would direct you to pages 17 to 19 of the Hein Executive Summary to find those. Um, a standard review of the internal affairs. This is the professional standards file for Officer Hein, reveals that he had no disciplinary history within the last three years. Now, we're shifting again using that executive summary as the foundation for a high level review of the incident. I want you to know we're going to start high level and then we're going to go to the actual redacted police report to dig in a little bit more. So the incident occurred on January 15th, 2019 at 2.38 PM where the police department received an anonymous call for service related to a suspicious truck in the alley. The caller reported that the pickup truck backed up to a backyard and two unknown subjects were loading up the vehicle. The caller indicated that they were concerned about the activity as there had been recent burglaries and thefts in the area. Officer Hine responded to the scene to investigate and activated his body worn camera upon arrival. He located the vehicle that the caller referenced in the alley and later identified who he would come to know as Antonio Arce Jr. inside the passenger compartment of the truck. He saw him rummaging through the truck. The truck at this point, the distance between the front bumper of Officer Hines patrol vehicle and the front bumper of the truck, they were facing each other, was approximately 26 feet. Officer Hine, when he noted Antonio exited his patrol vehicle and moved to a position behind a large dumpster that was located next to the vehicle. He continued to watch Antonio inside the truck. And when he saw Antonio holding an object, which he thought appeared to be a handgun, he saw it in his hand. At that time, Officer Hine drew his firearm from his holster and held it at a low and ready. And as you look at the documents, the pictures and the body worn camera, you will see what low and ready means. Antonio Arce exited the passenger side of that truck and then immediately began to run at a fast pace away from Officer Hine down the alley. Officer Hine moved from his position behind the dumpster and temporarily pursued Antonio along the driver's side of the truck and he yelled, hey. 
He moved from his position behind the dumpster and again gave chase and said, let me see your hands. At that time, Officer Hines stopped running. He took a shooting stance and discharged his weapon two times at Arce, who continued to run southbound away from Officer Hine. Officer Hine, the distance between him and Antonio Arce when he took his first shot was measured to be 114 and a half feet. That's 38 yards. The first shot was determined by investigators to have missed Antonio. The second shot, however, was determined to have struck him underneath the right scapula. That's the back, we'll talk about it later. The second shot was fired approximately one and a half seconds after Officer Hines' first shot. Antonio, after being shot, continued to run southbound and then made an L and ran eastbound down the alley and out of Officer Hines Field Division. CC, we call it CPR, um, and, and, and our terminology was administered on scene by police officers and paramedics, but Antonio Arce died from his wounds and was pronounced deceased at the hospital. Antonio was found to be in possession of a black airsoft replica 1911 handgun. Further area, further examination of the area where Antonio collapsed at the end of the alley showed a clear plastic container of orange airsoft BBs. And when Antonio was transported to the hospital, uh, two cell phones were retrieved from Anto Ar Antonio's uh, person. Um, and it was later determined that one of those cell phones belonged to the owner of the truck that Antonio was in. That's our high level executive summary review. I'm going to move now to the sizable police report that you have. I'm asking for Wydell to again, give me five minutes. I'm trying to pace this well for you all. And again, give the most robust overview of what we have. So if we're looking at what that anonymous caller, the context of that anonymous call, let's back up and start there. Tempe Police Department um, on January 15th, 2019, met with the anonymous caller at headquarters and interviewed him in a recorded interview room. He indicated that he called in anonymously twice from his phone number to first re report a suspicious, suspicious vehicle and then to report the shooting. He stated that he originally called the police to report the suspicious vehicle in an alley because he said that his rental house had been burglarized and he suspected that the residents from the house where the car, the truck rather was backed up to had taken his belongings and he was still missing items. He said he was currently doing renovations at his house on Fair Lane and he's there twice a week, but he was greatly concerned that if he didn't call in anonymously that their neighbors would figure him out and report him. He said that he heard what he thought was a loud muffler noise behind his house. He said he got out of his house and peeked around the corner of his fence and saw a Chevy pickup truck that had a taped back window and multiple colored panels on it. He said the pickup looked in poor condition and that he was suspicious because his property was not fully recovered from the address of where the, the truck was located. A few minutes later, he said he went back inside the house and said he did not see anyone out by the pickup truck and did not see anyone walking down the alley from the pickup truck. He then said he heard an argument from the alley and it sounded like someone was fighting. He heard someone say, drop the gun, put down the gun before hearing two gunshots from the alley. 
He said he looked out the back window of his house but could not see over the fence and said that he ran to the front and he saw the Antonio staggering quickly out from the alley and described what Antonio looked like. He said he saw Antonio on the other side of his wall. He said he saw that he was holding the gun and swinging it in, swinging it in his hand above the wall's height. He said he heard Antonio was making labored breathing and his walking pattern was staggered. A short time later, he explained that he saw a police officer running down the alley and then looked down the direction where Antonio was last seen walking with the gun in his hand. And he stopped and yelled, put your hands where I can see him. Uh, he said that the officer was looking back in the alley periodically as if he was expecting someone behind him. And he hadn't put together in his head that the police were responding to the call that he first made referencing the vehicle that led to the shooting. Let's now move to the vehicle itself. You heard me describe it a little bit, but you heard me talk about the condition of the vehicle. Um, the vehicle itself was owned um, by an individual, um, Lucio Silvas, owned that vehicle. He just purchased it from the owner and got it out of an impounded lot. When you've heard us talk about in the executive summary that there was the airsoft gun, both the airsoft handgun, the plastic bottle of pellets, and one of the cell phones were determined to be inside that truck uh, and owned by Lucio Silvis. Um, when um, <clears throat> The officers responded, again, looking at the vehicle. Um, a male exited the house that the truck was back up, backed up to, said it belonged to him. Um, and one of the officers stood with Lucio Silvis, the owner of that truck, while the incident um, was still going on with Antonio Arce. The officer asked Lucio Silvas what he was doing. He said he was unloading his salvage scrap items into the backyard of his friend's home. He said that he and his friend Leroy worked together um, in retrieving scrap metal. He was visiting his friend at the house with lots of tasks that they were doing and hanging out for the day. He and Leroy moved things into and out of the backyard and they were in the front of the residence when they heard the two loud pops and immediately ran into the alley where the truck was parked to make sure that um, Lucio, the owner of the truck, was okay. Um, when asked if there were any additional people helping Leroy and Lucio that had not been contacted at the house, he said there was not. Those are the two individuals that the anonymous caller referenced. Let's move again to a little bit of the description of the truck. And again, I'm trying to create as robust as I can, and then we'll move forward. Um, <clears throat> DNA was collected from the truck. The passenger door could not be open from the outside and the window on that passenger side could not be raised. The detective gave a theory that either the subject opened through the window to gain entry or uh, reached in using the interior handle, but also the uh, driver's side door was slightly ajar on, on further examination. Uh, the vehicle had markings on it from the impound in large white print from the top to the bottom of the windshield. There were several items of property, including metal, vehicle tires, beer cans, and trash bags in the bed of the truck. The rear window of the truck had been covered with plastic wrap material and clear tape since the glass of the window was not present. The interior passenger compartment of the vehicle also appeared to have miscellaneous items that we've talked about. I'll shift now um, to 
observations regarding Antonia. These observations came from one of the neighbors that was a witness to this. And if you will, please give me a little bit of grace as I go through this. It's important for you all to hear this. This neighbor stated he was in the backyard feeding his cats, cats when he heard one pop, which he believed to be gunfire. Uh, his name is Kevin, this neighbor. Kevin heard what sounded like someone running south in the gravel area located toward his backyard and then made the curve toward Fair Lane. As Antonio ran east past his backyard, Kevin was able to see a firearm being held up in the air in the subject's right hand. He demonstrated that for the officer, holding that his hand up above shoulder height in his right hand. Uh, Kevin's house has some missing cinder blocks in his back wall. Um, and so it is lower than most residential walls. And he advised that the gun was a black full size modern handgun. He looked at the officer's handgun and said it looked similar, but he did not know anything about guns and couldn't provide a description. Kevin, again, that neighbor ran from his backyard through his house to his front door so he could see what was happening. He used the small window in his front door to let him see onto Fair Lane and he saw Antonio standing in front of his house and then fall to the ground and not move from that spot. He saw Antonio moving a little bit in that area and then later, um, he did, Kevin, this neighbor, um, move from his backyard, I, I apologize. Um, Kevin was only able to see him running with the gun from the top of his shoulders up. He said he moved from his backyard into the front door um, and, and said he saw the Antonio move in what he called, quote, a woozy manner before falling to the ground. Uh, he said Antonio looked uncomfortable and then groaned a bit. Um, and then he saw the gun uh, and he stated it was in his right hand. I will tell you later, there was a voicemail from Kevin that said, stated that he Antonio was holding the gun in his left hand. We're moving um, again now to um, continued observations about Antonio. Um, Antonio appeared to be unconscious. Um, officers that contacted him rolled him from being face down to face up and began chest compressions on him, uh, continuous chest compressions. They called those CCCs. Um, and that is when one of the officers indicated that he, um, the handgun that was initially obscured from view because Antonio's body was on top of it, that's when it came and noted, and he noted uh, the, hand con, the handgun. The other portion of observations of, with respect to Antonio Arce is that <clears throat> though he was not moving, it also appeared that he was not breathing. It said one of the officers made contact with Antonio or came in contact with Antonio and with the assistance of officers Cano and Donwin, um, they saw that there was a gunshot wound to his right shoulder area because there was a hole in his blue shirt with a blood spot on that shirt. They handcuffed Antonio behind his back and that was when the CCCs were performed after they rolled him over. 150 chest compressions were performed by that officer. And then a second officer took over with additional chest compressions until Phoenix Fire Department arrived on scene. We have a couple of different scenarios and a couple of different officers on page 30 and page 52 of the police report that talk about when they noticed it was an airsoft pistol, when they noticed the orange tip at the airsoft pistol. <clears throat> 
also important on page 131 was one of the interactions with Antonio's mother. She spoke Spanish and a Spanish interpreter was utilized. <clears throat> um, she wanted to report that her 14 year old, um, when she arrived home, had not yet arrived. Uh, she indicated that he never does this and always tells her where he is. Uh, when asked if she ran away, she stated um, he does not and he gets into a little bit of trouble. Um, she provided a, an address uh, and said that Antonio was last seen at home when she left for work. Uh, she noted that he wasn't going to school because of a pending case. Um, and she'd already gone to the area where he usually hung out but did not see him. She last saw him at 8 a.m. when she left for work. The, <clears throat> this was during a call. His mother gave the date of birth and, 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 and um, described Antonio as having a nervous tick. She stated if he were to see the police, he would get nervous. And additionally, if the police told him to stop, he would not due to being nervous. Uh, she indicated she had family members in the area who had not seen him and she tried to call, but was not able to. No scars, no marks, no tattoos as identifiers for him. Moving now to observations of Officer Hine. Officer Hine was in his vehicle. <clears throat> Uh, that and he indicated that he was in the vehicle. Um, I, I'm sorry, give me one moment. I want to make sure I, I state this correctly. Detective Ramos, I apologize, located Officer Hine and walked with Officer Hine after the shooting. These observations of Officer Hine are all of what we know based on the compilation of these reports regarding what he said. <clears throat> he indicated to Officer Pena that the vehicle on scene was the vehicle that was involved and so they should preserve the truck in, the area of, in that area of evidence. And he also indicated that there was no one else outstanding that was involved with this incident. As you remember, the anonymous caller said there were two individuals and now Officer Hines said there was one. Um, Detective Ramos waited with Officer Hine until driving him into the Hardy substation. He was with Officer Hine until approximately 6 p.m. and did not discuss the incident with him. Officer Hine, um, uh, was also witnessed by one of the neighbors, uh, Luis Hernandez. Uh, Luis indicated he thought that maybe the officer needed help and was worried for the officer, off, worried for the officer because he could see that the officer was shaking. Uh, Luis Hernandez showed me, meaning showed the officer, his own hands like he was holding a handgun while shaking. Detective Ramos then this is the, the police report. Let's shift back over to the executive summary. Um, Detective Ramos indicated that the contact he had with Officer Hine was minimal and specifics regarding the shooting were not discussed and there were no interviews. Uh, Detective Ramos recall Officer Hine is looking distraught, describing that Officer Hine's hands were covering his face. He got closer to Officer Hine, meaning Detective Ramos got closer to Officer Hine. And he said he recalled Officer Hine say, quote, I didn't know it was a toy gun, end quote. <clears throat> Detective Ramos then had an officer to officer conversation with Officer Hine and so muted the body worn camera so that they could they were not in the presence of any suspects or witnesses at that time. The body worn camera. In the body worn camera in the executive summary review of the body worn camera. 
Sergeant Johnson indicated he never saw Antonio Arce turn toward Officer Hine. Um, Antonio Arce was discovered on the body worn camera and Officer Hine can be heard on vi video giving Arce commands such as put your arms out or I will shoot you again. There was no response from Arce after the commands were given. Officer Hine is heard continuing to yell commands at Arce while also giving directions over the radio to back up officers as to how to approach the scene. Body worn camera footage was shared with an outside expert, Grant Frederick, for enhancement and analysis. The analysis included the following conclusions. The camera was too low to the ground to see over the rear bed of the vehicle. The camera did not see into the cab of the vehicle as Hine moved by the driver's door. And again, I want to make sure that's clear. As Hine moved towards the driver's door, the, Hine, the camera did not see into the cab of the vehicle. The camera did not show where Hine's eyes or head were moving and the camera produced a wider perspective of the events than the perspective of Hine. Those wider perspective results in objects appearing further away than they are in reality. In reviewing Frederick's report, the executive summary and the administrative finding found that there was no overt action by Arce, which would have placed Officer Hine in immediate and or imminent danger. And this was observed by body worn camera footage. There is a firearm expert, a firearms training officer, Officer Schmidt, that's been with the city for the past 12 years. He's recognized by Arizona Post as a subject matter expert in firearms training and tactics. He conducts annual video scenario based judgmental testing on Tempe PD sworn police officers. These tests are called judgmentals and are required for police officers to maintain their state certification through AZ Post, that is Arizona Peace Officer Standards and Training Board. In each of the scenarios, officers make use of force decisions based on the actions of the actors in the video, and officers must demonstrate their proficiency. Once you look at that, you will find that Officer Schmidt explained that with the materials he reviewed, he did not see a justification for using deadly force against Antonio Arce. There are preliminary, invest preliminary reports, and I will move. I have five minutes left in this summary, so I will move to the policies. The Tempe use of force policies are outlined on pages 13 through 14 and pages 23 through 24 of Officer Hine Executive Summary. And the City of Tempe personnel rules are outlined on page 24 of Officer Hine Executive Summary. Per the Tempe Police General Rules, a preponderance of the evidence is the burden of proof by which an administrative review is conducted. Again, in an administrative review, in order to find guilt, it's by a preponderance of the evidence. There are one, two, three, four, five different findings. Unfounded, which means the allegation is false or without merit. Not sustained, which means there's insufficient evidence to either prove or disprove an allegation. Sustain, which means the allegation is supported by sufficient evidence to justify a reasonable conclusion of guilt. Exonerated, mean it was lawful and proper or policy, er policy failure, which means the employee's actions were proper conduct according to established policy and procedure, but a change in that policy is warranted. It was found Again, it was found in the administrative review that for the department's use of force departmental guidelines sustained, there was guilt. An alleged act or failure by personnel that is contrary to verbal and or written rules, regulations, procedures, directives, 
or orders of the department was also sustained. And with regard to the city of Tempe personnel rules on grounds for disciplinary action that states, quote, the employee has acted negligently, recklessly, or carelessly in performing his or her duties, that allegation was also sustained. That is the summary of the case. My next slide, please, Wydell. We are on frame 14, 3.02 notable failures. Thank you. As Rosa mentioned and Chief Glover mentioned and Assistant Chief Cooley as well as Commander Horn, the first thing they said was this should never have happened. I never should have fired his weapon. I have to tell you that there is deep sadness that still permeates the department to this day about what happened in January of 2019. But part of the process of growth is acknowledging guilt and wrongdoing and PD is doing just that with listing what they're calling some of the notable failures. This is just a start, but what they're saying is where did we go wrong? Where did the department, where did Hind go wrong? And with your help in the process, we together will identify more areas of notable failures and explore how to take these brave steps together. The bare minimum of, of training on de-escalation and exposure scenarios should not have happened. There was not a unified citywide process for officer wellness when it comes to PTSD and when it comes to veterans and active duty versus non-active duty. There were failures in how messaging was communicated inaccurately to the community and even the timeliness of notification to the family and to the community. This, these are deeply, deeply troublesome failures, but also ones that are there and noted and saying, we're sorry, where do we go from here? I'm asking you in this couple of moments um, in our next slide, based on this presentation and based on what you heard, this is not a question um, around policy recommendations um, or, or policy changes, but just questions of fact. I see that this question clarifying question pad has been pre-populated, but if you have some questions, please put them in the chat. We'll be sure to continue to populate this pad. And then anything that is not answered tonight, I personally commit to take back to the police department, to the legal department, to the city manager's office, and wherever is absolutely necessary to get the answers that you require. I want to give a little space if there's questions that are not already there or not been there. Um, in the chat so far, but I thank you. I am honored by the time and the space that you've given me. And I look forward to doing this with you all. Any questions? Thank you, Jonae. We do have some questions coming in through chat that we're moving over to the questions pad. Okay. Um, so we these are all questions generated within the last half an hour Perfect. during your uh, case review okay. so they will be memorialized for you and for us in regards to finding out the information that you've requested as well as circling back with you in regards to these questions thank you Wydell. that's our commitment one of the, the things thing that I ask of the task force before we move, our next thing is a break, is really just a moment of silence. A moment of silence for Antonio. A moment of silence for all the names in our country to honor and respect them as we do this good work.
Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank We're you. going to shift now to a break so that you can go back to those questions that were asked on that first slide. And then after that break, um, we're going to look at your ideas, your areas of learning, those things that this case brought to mind, where we can drop them in the buckets of policy laws, accountability, the police service model, mental health, data analytics, recruitment, communication, and whatever other thing you deem fit. I have this gray sky for this, this blue sky for a reason, which is reaching for the sky and what we're trying to do today. So take 10 minutes. Um, think of really three things that you want to present once we go to this facilitation model. And um, I pass it back to you, Wydell. Thank you, Janae. We will um, start our 10 minute break. We'll, con we'll re reconvene at about 528. Um, please be kind to yourselves during the break and we will see you on the other side in regards to moving with our next stage of our meeting tonight. Thank you. So thank you for joining us following this first break of the evening. We will have a, another break later after some of our individual and small group work. My name is Wydell Holmes. I'm with the Office of Strategic Management and Diversity. And I just want to also thank you for coming along in this case review as we utilize this information to inform our strategic planning. We do have some questions on our questions pad, and I do want to uh, echo Janae's uh, statement in regards to answering the questions. Again, the case review was not to relitigate, but to find out where and uncover areas that would inform our strategic planning. So I'm gonna ask you in the next phase of tonight's meeting, some of these questions that you've asked are actually inspiring for what ideas might we have to incorporate into our strategic planning. So don't look at them solely as questions that are unanswered. Maybe these are areas that should be continued to be explored as we create and recommend strategies coming from the task force. I'm going to move to uh, frame 17. And the title of this is 4.01. And again, I introduce myself. I'm with our Office of Strategic Management and Diversity. And I'm happy to um, facilitate this next session. It, it's an honor and a privilege. And I can just really appreciate the support of the RSA family for letting us utilize this case to inform our recommendations. So just as a quick review, I'm on uh, frame 18 now. If you are still trying to find your place on the Miro board, um, it, as we continue through, through the night, feel free to follow my face. It's in the upper, towards the third right hand, the third of the screen in the right hand corner. If you need any technical support, feel free to put that in our chat. And I'm gonna ask also our tech, uh, Elisa, to also uh, re-enter into chat our support with our CARE 7 counselor, Maria, um, should you need to reach out to her tonight or following this meeting this evening or even in subsequent days, feel free to do that. So in the workshop process, we're looking at this case and how it can inform our strategic planning. So in Janae's overview- Wendell, Wendell, can I ask you a question before you move into that? Sure, Roy. There, I think there were a number of questions mm -hmm. that were asked germane to what Janae was going over. Are we going to be able to hear the answers to that or is that coming later? I, I don't want to jump ahead, you know, but yeah. it's, it's on my mind. So I want to make sure I get I get it out before, you know. I understand, Roy. We'll be um, providing some time after our our group process here. And, and again, I don't want to lean so much on process, 
but I do want to kind of keep you in that place of what reactions that you had to the overview that would inform our planning. Um, okay. I don't want to have the, where the answers to the questions already purport or constrain ideas that we might have um, in regards to that. So I appreciate your question and, and appreciate um, you reminding us about those. Um, we do want to make sure that we come back around to those questions and it may take place in tonight's meeting for some of them. <clears throat> some of the questions we may send out a different communication so that we make sure that we get to all of the questions. That's our, our also of our, of our concern is making sure that every question is um, responded to um, from the knowledge that we have collectively here, as well as other knowledge that we might have to seek, you know, internally at the city. So thank you, Roy, I appreciate that. No problem, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Um, so as Rosa mentioned before, we're going to, you know, following this case review, we'll be doing some individual thinking and reflection as well as, <clears throat> sorry, as well as looking for group ideas. From those group ideas, we'll be able to start putting some ideas together and themes that will start forming our strategic planning framework. What's important, and, and this is probably the most difficult part in regards to <clears throat> taking a case with such a tragic ending and, and actually a, a, a tragic outcome and putting that and saying, what would that have looked like in three to five years from now and in the future based on the recommendations that this team is able to make in the next few months? And so with that, um, we'll work as a group to do some first individually, then we'll move you into some small groups, and then we'll have some full group discussion. So what I'd like to invite you to do, and I'm on a frame 19 now on the Miro board, is individually take a few moments, and we'll take about 10 minutes to do this, a little bit of quiet time for you. And what are your key insights from this case? And some of those insights have already been generated by some of the questions that you've asked. What were the insights that um, we need to address? What were some themes that started to come up through you, um, for you through the case review? And then what ideas could we continue to explore? So if you wanna to refer to your notes during the case, um, if you wanna document probably about 10 ideas that maybe try for 10, eight to 10 ideas that were generated in regards to your reaction and your knowledge and your information about the, uh, about the case, as well as your questions that you have about the case. Um, so take a few moments. We're gonna take about 10 minutes here. Uh, feel free to go off camera and have some quiet moments to yourself in regards to creating eight to 10 ideas that can inform our strategic planning. Wydell? Yes, Rosa. May I just clarify? Sure. Roy, thank you for that sure. question. Wydell answered your question perfectly. What I might just do is give an example as you all, all oh, think sure. about your ideas. I see VD had posted on the chat how many hours before Antonio was killed and his mom was notified. So if we take a question like that, and if you have a question like that, and you start thinking about what idea so instead of having the police department answer how long it took, perhaps the ultimate idea is basically what do you see should happen? Um, mm -hmm. So that becomes the idea. So I just wanted to give that an example that as well you said. ask questions, it shifts into no matter what policy or anything that might be explained, VD for you is what is the answer and the idea that you are trying to convey with asking that question. I hope that helps. Well said, thank you, Rosa. So thank you for taking those 10 minutes or so to brainstorm some of your ideas. I'd like to remind you to star your top three ideas. <clears throat> And before we move into breakout group, groups, I have brought you all to the frame that I am on. 
I'm going to next move us to our breakout room frame just to give you a little bit of an overview, excuse me, of what we'll be doing next in our session tonight. So in looking at what we can learn from this case for our planning, um, in a moment, we're gonna move you to breakout rooms and you'll find the breakout room in the next slide. Uh, as Marza mentioned earlier, just for time's sake, we pre-assigned a scribe for you. We also have already have rooms ready for you to go and you'll have a workspace in your room. During the breakout session, we ask that you verbally share your top three ideas. So we'll do a little bit of a round robin. Your facilitator will help with that. After everybody has had a chance to share their top three ideas, one at a time, we'll write, um, we'll ask you to come to a group, uh, to form a group understanding around seven or eight, nine ideas that you can move forward to the main session. You may find some common threads and we're gonna ask that um, the facilitator help you summarize those ideas into seven to nine ideas. And then we'll bring those to the large group space for discussion. The Miro scribes, we've asked that they put only one idea on the note and then that they do a phrase of about three to seven words. So again, we're gonna verbally share ideas. So for the first 10, 20 minutes or so, we won't be scribing um, any ideas. We're gonna just share and um, talk with each other and have a conversation about these ideas. And then we'll follow that and scribe then the group ideas that you can bring forward to the main session. This process will take us about an hour and we will conclude the small group discussion with a brief break before we come back into the main session. So with that, we're going to whisk you away to your Zoom room. All right, I have a, a quick sure. comment. Sure, Vidi. Thank you all. Um, <clears throat> thank you also, Janae, for you know giving the, the summary. I just wanted to also highlight some of the things that the family experienced because I think it's very important as we're going okay. into the breakout to also consider these. Um, so a few things that I wanted to highlight after the shooting, right? Um, and I don't know, I was asking how, how much time between, you know, when Antonio was killed and the mom was notified. And um, it's at least 10 hours in between that time, even after, right, the mom and the report, like, made a call and asked. Um, but within those two hours, the parents did call his cell phone several times and the, you know, the cell phone said mom on the phone. Um, and the family was not communicated at all during this. At the same time, you know, when this was happening, a narrative came out about um, a 14 year old, you know, about someone pointing a gun. So I think the false narratives are like not the full narrative <clears throat> about what actually happened. It's one of the most devastating things that families have to deal with um, after shootings. Um, you know, we see it time and time again. Um, she was, you know, notified that um, he pointed a gun at the police. And that was not true. That was not factual. And that was not confirmed. There was no investigation. But that is what the family was told. Um, you know, we see this case in case um, similar, right? The mom that one of the moms we're talking to right now, um, like with Ryan Whitaker in Phoenix, uh, she was told your son, um, you know, was abusive and, you know, now come to find out like that is actually not what happened. But that false narrative is one of the things that the families most like, have to deal with during uncertainty. Um, then there was a push for video camera footage um, the, that was like withheld for a long time, uh, but, you know, for more time than the family, you know, wanted to know like what happened to my baby. Um, when they were finally allowed to see the video, um, I was uh, able to go with them to the location. Um, their attorney was not allowed to go in to see the footage, even though, again, police officers are allowed their attorneys in um, when being investigators seeing or seeing footage. So I wanted to highlight that. Um, they were only given about 30 minutes before the footage was released to the media. When the mom um, saw this, I mean, you can imagine just 
um, completely devastated, um, had to be hospitalized. So both the parents were at the hospital. Um, and because it was just a media, like as they were watching it, the media was what like was also releasing it. Antonio's little siblings, um, 10 year old and seven, watched their brother get killed on the media without the parents there as well. Um, so they saw the footage, their parents were at the hospital. Um, thankfully, like in that, someone was able to like see and turn off the cameras. And so that's another piece of this highlight, right? Like the, the what happens to with the media and those communications uh, throughout this whole process, the family um, did not feel respected or honored. And, um, and you know, throughout this whole process, like so, so there was many times when we encountered officers, including when the family went watch the video, that um, those officers were just rude. Uh, they were like, did not have compassion, um, did not, um, you know, they were like, it, it was just like a hard, I can't even explain what it was, but those are some of the things I wanted also to highlight, like in the aftermath of, of this, um, the family uh, also uh, then, you know, as y'all can imagine, the expenses of all of this, like now, like the funeral, now this, and then um, the trauma that not only they were experiencing as, as the parents, but also the children. So I want to just also highlight those pieces so as y'all go into breakout and think about things I need to change that 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 is also part of. Um, and that's just a little bit that is in my mind right now. Thanks. Billy, thank you so much for sharing that perspective. And I think that, um, for example, what Rosa said earlier, those are experiences that can inform our planning. So thank you for your, your courage in sharing that as well as your openness to do so with the group here tonight. I really appreciate that. Um, so we'll, we'll take information from the case review and also from the eloquent uh, information that Viri gave us in regards to communications, uh, communications with family, timing, media management. Those are some of the things, Viri, that I heard. Forgive me if I've missed anything. Um, and move those ideas as well into the breakout rooms. So again, we'll be in the breakout rooms for about an hour. And uh, following that, we'll have a, a, a quick break before we come back to the main session your ideas. I know, Janae, I just saw your... <laughs> I, yeah, I'm sorry. For our timing, I had it documented as a, a start time at 5.55 and an end time of 6.55 of an hour. So our group is not at consensus yet. Okay. And I'd like to give them that right. Okay. Um, so with that, we'll, why don't we do this? We will skip our break and we can go back to our breakout rooms to finalize that. I'd like to give you that space. And if everybody's willing to do that, um, we certainly want to stay flexible in, in the process here. It's not about the process. It's really about the outcome. Um, so we'll go ahead and do that for another 10 minutes and uh, go back from and then come back to the main group. And if we have to uh, pause at seven and resume in our next meeting, we certainly can do that. Um, our office is committed to just making this a, a very worthwhile uh, process so that we have the outcomes that are needed for our community um, in regards to policing and trust and accountability. So I'm going to ask Elisa to move us back to breakout rooms that we were currently in or previously in. All right, so it looks like we have everyone back is coming back into our main session. And with the hour being close to seven o'clock um, and with the mayor's support, one of the things that he wanted to make sure happens tonight is to loop back around to some of the questions that the group may have had. So I'm going to actually pause on our full group discussion regarding the small breakout rooms. Um, we will resume that at our next opportunity when we meet and continue that, but again, we're cognizant that process needs to also be balanced with us as humans and um, we don't want to leave you tonight with something that you know must be answered for you um, so i'm going to turn this back over to rosa and most likely invite the the chief back into the session i believe he is still 
I'll say white elephant one thing Sorry. really quickly. Sorry, I didn't, uh -huh. I didn't interrupt. But yeah, it was just basically, um, you know, based on, you know, some of the comments that Roy yeah. made towards the beginning of the session, which were, you know, right. just not wanting people to to walk away at the end of this, that there are questions that they really feel like. And I know that, you know, I, I appreciate, you know, Janae's commitment to make sure that every question is answered from the session, but I just right. didn't want anyone to walk away saying, hey, I had a question that emotionally I needed to get off my chest this evening. And right. even if we have to run over a little bit, frankly, I would rather have those, I'd rather err on that side than, okay. than not, so. So one way that we could do this um, is, I know some, we have captured on, our, our um, question pad, which is frame 15, and I can bring you all to that. Um, we can go off of some of those questions, but I'd also like to propose if you have a question that just must, to the mayor's words, must be answered tonight, if you could just put your name in the chat and we'll go in that order. And I am trying to get my chat back up. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Thanks, Rico. Okay, so is there, um, we have the question pad holds all the questions so far, but is there someone who has a question um, to Roy, to, we mentioned you in our group actually to your point about that must be answered tonight. And I'm gonna call on you my friend to maybe start us off with something that was, was a burning question for you. Well, uh, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And I will, I will say I've had a, a number of questions about this that, that spoke to the physical fitness requirement of uh, Tempe police officers, because mm -hmm. in the video, in the body camera footage, you clearly hear the officer out of breath, winded after a short foot pursuit. Many believe that had he been in better physical condition, that he may have not drawn his weapon um, if he could have had a better, a more successful pursuit. Um, mm -hmm. So what? What are, are the physical requirements uh, or the physical fitness requirements of Tempe police officers? And I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lean on Chief Glover and Assistant Chief Mike Pooley for that answer. So I, I can help answer that, Roy. Thank, Thank you, Mike. for asking that. With, um, when you're initially hired, the physical fitness requirements are not extensive. Uh, as they used to be. Right now, I believe it's a, you have to be able to run a mile and a half under 14 minutes. You have to be able to do 21 push-ups and uh, at least 30 sit-ups within a minute. And that's the extent of it. You then go through the police academy and they continue to do physical fitness training throughout. And at, a lot of times that's where it stops. Um, we don't currently have requirements that require you to stay uh, physically fit. We highly encourage it. We have a lot of things that help with that, but there is nothing that is required. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Um, let's see. So within about a week, we all could work out and join the force. <laughs> Sorry, I just, I just had to <laughs> throw that out there. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Roy. Um, is there someone else who has a question that they really want to have answered tonight as much as, as best we can? Um, mental health or mental, mental health connected. I'm reading through the chat here. Um, Jacob. Yeah, I was literally Rayford. about to ask about the um, mental health requirements. I saw okay. right as I was getting ready to say that someone had to enter that in the chat. Uh, we are discussing that in our group as well. The mental health requirements for individuals entering a line of service uh, determine that based off the information um, in the report uh, that this individual was under a lot of stress and that coupled with the ability to potentially take someone's life is um, more than often a volatile combination and mm -hmm. we can see that resulted in the 14 year old uh, child being murdered um, so we just wanted to know if there's any sort of um, standard or what that standard would look like if there is okay so any, um, so I'll again lean on the chief and uh, assistant chief Pooley in regards Sorry. to mental health. 
in terms of of the the standard for the officer coming in is that the question I, I think it's more my interpretation jacob or maybe i'll just go back to you jacob can you clarify that for the chief yeah so um of course coming in to the line of service but um are there any um like mental health checks or anything of that nature that would be able to determine whether this individual is still fit to serve um you know that's more or less what i was asking mm. Okay, I, I now I understand where you're going, Jacob. I um, thank you for, for clarifying. Um, I believe that with our mental health um, aspect uh, for officers, uh, there's a lot more that could be done. Uh, we, we do have mental health checks that are for various work groups. So if you work in sex crimes or homicide, um, you're exposed to a lot of different things that are going on. And so they, you know, we typically will have uh, the people that are working within those areas go in for psychological evaluations on a on a more of a quarterly basis. Um, it's really something that we're exploring is is having all employees go through that because it's important to ensure that you know you're putting out an employee that is that is uh, well you know mentally sound, um, and you never know what cumulative. A stress or PTSD uh, can occur in, in this line of work with officers. And I think that's been pretty much proven uh, nationwide. And so over a certain period of time, you want to make sure that that they're actually, you know, being able to, you know, um, show that they're, you know, that they're taking care of themselves, but then also that we also are supporting them and taking care of them and their own mental health. And so that's, that's really um, an important factor, uh, I believe, in this in this current situation that you guys have just reviewed, um, you know, things have slipped through the cracks, and we we really have to look at what we're doing um, on a mental health aspect for our officers to make sure that we're providing that care that's needed. Okay. And I don't know if Mike Thank wants to chief. expand on that. Thank you, Chief. Yeah, I'll add real quick, uh, Jacob. Thanks for that question. Uh, one of the things I'll say is when somebody is initially hired, they do go through a very extensive background check, and that includes a psychological examination with uh, a clinical psychologist that they go through to make sure that they're fit for the job. Um, they look at past trauma they may have been exposed to, whether it was in the military or, or uh, other events in their life. We want to make sure that when they are initially hired, they are physically fit to go through the academy and psychologically well to be able to perform the duties of a police officer. Uh, just to follow up on that question, um, who actually, what company actually performs the mental health checks for officers that are ongoing on, on, the, on the job who have been in uh, officer involved shootings and continue to remain on the force? So we have a few contract uh, doctors. I don't know who they are right offhand, but we can get that to you. Great, thank you. So, um, any Listen. other burning, Betty, any other burning questions? Yeah, I was trying to type it, but I'm just going to say. That's okay, it. Betty. And it can be later, but I think what one thing that Jacob and Keisha have brought up is that <clears throat> there was a lot of red flags and why this officer should not be on the streets, at least from what we saw from domestic violence, mental health, uh, PTSD all of these things that came evident later. So as I guess the, my question is, what if any system exists? Um, and I think they're called like intervention, whatever um, any exists that can, that could have told us that this officer should not, that this cop should not have been on the streets. Um, mm -hmm. So it doesn't have to be answered today, but there, there is something, uh, and, and again, who, who wrote it, who oversees it, um, isn't. Yeah, and sorry, sorry to take up so much space, but just to kind of add on to what Vidi's saying, um, there were court filings uh, after the fact that showed that uh, his wife divorced him because of his PTSD and the fact that he was um, abusive, tumultuous and abusive um, in their own personal relationship, but yet he continued to remain on the force and therefore a young boy was murdered by him because of his mental instability. Whose job is it on the force to make sure that this isn't happening, that police officers are not out there in the streets running mm -hmm. rampant with the, with the authority to uh, hunt and kill 
what they are perceived uh, perceived threats with this Thank mental you. instability. Thank you, Keisha, for the question. I'd like to move to Melody. She's been very patient. I, I didn't see you on the other screen. Melody, your question. Uh, yeah, one of the um, the uh, themes that we came up with in the group was um, accountability and what that looks like in terms of um, really the the investigation process in general and what the current city's uh, disciplinary action looks like if the officer is found um, to be negligent. Mm -hmm. um, we, we were a little, we weren't educated on that process as it exists now, so it was difficult to provide recommendations moving forward. Okay, thank you. So we're going to move forward. I'd like to turn it back over to Rosa, and I'm going to move to um, one of our frames. It's, excuse me, <clears throat> it is a frame, let's see, I'm back here, uh, frame number 28, and I will bring you all to me. And I will turn it back to Rosa and Chelsea. I think at this late hour, thank you, everyone. Uh, it's a great night. It's, a, it's an exhausting night, I can say. Um, we're going to continue this conversation. Um, and I think we always built in flexibility in this process. And uh, I believe we're going to come back and actually answer some questions that you have. We'll compile those. And with the help of chiefs um, to answer some of those questions early and then probably go back into the room and refine some of those suggestions because you've already identified those suggestions we just didn't go into the general room to share those mm -hmm. um, so you'll receive an agenda with an explanation but please know those questions will be answered and i appreciate your time and um, your commitment to this truly do and at this point, I would like to turn it over to our mayor for closing remarks. Uh, I'll be very brief again. I just wanted to thank uh, everyone for uh, coming to have this discussion tonight. I know it was, it's a very hard, very emotional discussion. Um, and I just really appreciate everyone's willingness to go through this with the city of Tempe and frankly have this conversation. I think we really are trying to get to a better place and um, I just really appreciate your participation. And also just wanted to uh, very quickly to thank Rosa personally. Um, she and I had a conversation about doing about doing this, about doing the kind of case study uh, regarding the Antonio Arce um, regarding Antonio Arce and um, just appreciate her too for having the courage to have this conversation with everyone. I know there are a lot of times where you know other cities are not going to want to have discussions about situations like this. Um, but the fact that she, you know, she brought it to me and said, like, I really, you know, I trust these, you know, the folks on this call as you do, Corey, to have this conversation and to really help to get us to a better place. Um, you know, I really appreciate her bringing this to me and I appreciate her courage for bringing it up. And I also wanted to also publicly, um, you know, to thank the, the RSA family for frankly allowing us to have this conversation with you. Uh, this would not have taken place if they had not wanted us to have this discussion, but I appreciate uh, their willingness to know that we would uh, treat their, you know, treat their family and treat their son's memory with respect and have this discussion with you this evening. So I just wanted to say thank you to them publicly as well. So um, definitely looking forward to our next meeting and appreciate everyone's time tonight and letting us go a little bit over time. Thank you, Mayor. And just as a reminder, our next meeting will be on December 2nd. And do want to remind the group um, in regards to the Public Safety Advisory Task Force webpage that we have at the city. We will um, resend that to you via email uh, from Brianne, and we'll make sure that you have that. That is where all the minutes, the recordings, the chat, and the documentation are being shared uh, with you as well as with the public. And we are committed to getting um, uh, the library started. Uh, in regards to resources that you may also want to uh, contribute. So please feel free to send those to Brianne and we'll get those up on the webpage as well. So with that, um, thank you. Uh, we wish you all well and have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a good evening, everybody. <laughs>